Hi, you're listening to Thoughtful Wellness Revolution, where we believe wellness isn't wellness if it's just for you. We're your hosts, Zara and Hien. And before we get started, please make sure to give us a five-star rating and review. Even though we're a podcast that believes in decolonizing, we're still bound to the algorithm. So every little bit that you can help us out, we really appreciate it. And we thank you for all the support. Let's get into it. Hello, friends. Today, we're talking to Harpinder Kaur Man, a yoga and mindfulness educator and the co-founder of the Women of Color Summit from Tongva Land, which is also known as Los Angeles. So Harpinder, what's on your mind today? Well, first of all, thank you both so much for having me here. Um, we were chatting even a little bit before we started recording um, on how you both connected. And it's been so wonderful to chat about your sort of journey with yoga. Um, but what's been on my mind lately? What's been on my mind is a Instagram post that I saw yesterday. And I can't stop thinking about it where it said like surrender to your reaction of the reaction. And I was like, what does this mean? And I got like super deep into it. And it was talking about, and I, and I feel like this is something people that are on the spiritual path or the mindful path will resonate with is, you know, we try to become better at how we respond and how we react so that when something pisses us off or catches off, catches us off guard, we don't behave badly. Um, and we, you know, start to create that space between that reaction and response. And I know I have found myself, particularly even last week where I was on hold, like with the call center, I'm losing my patience. And I'm like, oh, like, I'm not supposed to be like this anymore. I'm supposed to be calm. And then had a little bit of guilt and a little bit like, oh, I shouldn't have reacted in that way. And in the post, what it was saying was surrendering to that reaction that you had of the reaction where it's like that happened. Yes, maybe you behaved badly and she even put badly in like air quotes. Maybe that doesn't mean anything like that. Um, and it's like surrendering to, okay, that's how you reacted. There's no reason to like get guilty or shameful about it. And it's just like, that's what it was. You learn from it. And the next time, maybe you do a little bit better. Um, so that's literally been on my mind since yesterday. It's all I can think about. And it's been, it's been helpful. It's been like a helpful um, reframe to have. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. Like that, like when you first said that line, it was like blowing my mind too. I was like, whoa, what does that mean? It sounds so meta. Um, but when you describe it, I'm like, oh yeah, it sounds like you're talking about something that we could all use like a reminder of which just mm. to basically have grace for ourselves right mm. like to have grace for ourselves and um compassion for you know some of the maybe quote like bad behaviors or or quote bad feelings uh we might have um because we're human <laughs> mm. so yeah thank you so much uh for sharing that and uh, thank you so much for being here um Zara and I, you know, we said this to you earlier before we started recording that uh, when we first, um, you know, started with this podcast, we were always thought like, oh, yeah, one day we're going to get um, the girls from the Women of Color Summit to like talk to us, you know, like, like, we're just like hoping to um, have you on and um, you had reached out to us. And I just want to say like, thank you. And also to say that, that you are the first person who has reached out to ask to be on the podcast. And we love that. Like, I love the fact that you said like, Hey, uh, I'd like to be on your podcast. So I'm thinking like, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for like knowing that, um, you have something really cool to contribute in this conversation, um, mm -hmm. or these conversations that we've been having. Um, but yeah, so what I, we kind of just want to start to ask, um, by, wanting to know a little bit more about your work. Um, you know, can you tell us a bit more about your work and all the wonderful things that um, you do? Well, first of all, thank you for affirming, um, you know, me reaching out to be like, hey, I would love to be on y'all's podcast. And um, I also want to say like, thank you for the way that y'all quickly responded back. And it was such an easeful, like, process even to getting to this conversation today um so i'm like oh i was the first one to reach out um and you know what's interesting is 
because I, I work with mainly women of color is sometimes that feeling of like, oh, am, am I going to be too much? Like they probably aren't even going to want me. And it's like we self limit ourselves. Whatever dream we have, we're like, oh, that's not going to happen. And it's just like, well, you know, give it a shot. Um, and and I also want to say like, you know, there's systems of oppression and other things that also cause us to self limit in that way. So for me in my work, it's all around helping women of color, people of color reclaim their power, tap into their intuition. And it's like the thing that you really want to go after, like, what is it? That first step is like, you know, just speaking it out loud. I feel like so many of us have these dreams that we keep like shoved down super secret or we don't even want to reveal it to ourselves. And it's that first step of like, let's create a safe space where share your dream with me. Like, let's have that be affirmed and seen and heard. Um, and so, yeah, that kind of led into some of the work that I do is I do work with um, primarily folks of color. I am a yoga teacher, a mindfulness educator, the co-founder of the Women of Color Summit. Now I'm like, oh, we should have Irene, we should have had Irene here as well. So I'll have to tell her, um, we mentioned you. <laughs> we'll add in a word from you. Um, and my work now in the last four years has been really about like how do we uplift and celebrate and empower folks of color in healing, in reaching their dreams, in having these communities where they feel safe to talk about conversations like how to decolonize yoga, um, talking about things where maybe you have felt racially gaslit. And, and I know for myself, I've been in situations and experiences where I'm like, hey, this doesn't feel right, but then the people in power don't really care. And it's just like a double hurt where it's like I kind of had that first experience and the second experience. So this isn't right. And like no one cares. I'm like, ooh, doubly stabbed. Um, and so with the Women of Color Summit in my work is really around for folks of color to like access their own ancestral practices, their own spiritual practices to connect back to their power, to have these communities and spaces. Um, and it's been I've been working full time for myself now for the last two years. It'll be my two year anniversary on my birthday, August 14th. Um, thank you for clapping. <laughs> um, and it's been just like the best thing ever. It's been very challenging at times. There's been the like, should I just give it up and go back to a nine to five? And as my partner reminds me, the nine to five has its own challenges. You prefer these challenges. Um, so it's been just so wonderful the kind of people that I get to work with just those like service oriented heart compassion oriented um and being able to see people experiencing healing in a way that's actually healing um and you're not just being like re-triggered going into a space that's supposed to be healing um but is far from it yeah thank you so much for you know sharing all that with us and I also just want to tell everyone like oh yeah like you're a Leo and I'm a Leo so I just want to say mm, like shout out yes. <laughs> um because as we're recording today it's Leo season so it you know, is I'm, Leo season right um so I'm all about um you know Leo's taking up space during mm. Leo season so <laughs> um yeah I I definitely feel what you describe as like it's like a double stabbing where you go into a space and you may feel hurt um and the people who actually would have the power to like make it better mm -hmm. right or to make amends um also really don't they don't care right and and how um hurtful that can be like I, when you described it I was like oh yeah I felt that way uh, many spaces um in that way professional spaces uh, wellness, yoga spaces, uh, personal, you know, like with friendships and stuff and how much that, um, can really like wear you down. Um, and so, you know, I'm curious to know, um, kind of maybe backtrack a little bit, like, cause I think you mentioned that you started to do this work maybe four years ago. I kind of want to know, like, so how exactly did that start for you where you're like, huh, I think I want to do this instead, or like, consider working more with uh folks of color 
Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I started really practicing yoga in, I was practicing like 2013, 2014, but um, it was at your very white led yoga studios in the West side. I was going to UCLA at the time, like your core power yoga works. Um, I would go in and I was like, ah, what is this? Um, and I was like, it, I feel like it has to be different. And I was like, this can't be right. And it wasn't until I went to India in 2015 on my own, I was working for a small startup. I started going to the Ananda Sangha and it was just life-changing. Um, just so very devotional to God, to these practices, to community. The asana was so light like we didn't move very much um and in the way that they practice they always would have affirmations um with each asana that we did and in that moment i just felt every time i like went back in a taxi back to my hotel i was just crying i was like oh my god this is what i've been searching for without even really realizing and i've i've spoken about this in other podcast episodes and um in articles i was raised as um raised by very strict conservative traditional punjabi sikh parents um so raised like very religious um i had a japji sab like or the guru gun sab in my hands probably at the age of three um having to read like the scripture but it was this it was this sort of like contrast of we have to believe these things and then seeing the way that my dad actually acted and he has um definitely undiagnosed mental illness um so it's just very like you know sharp contrast between like okay like seek like values and principles now as i'm older and i've kind of got back and gotten back into it myself is very beautiful um very much about equality between men and women very much about social justice um very much about giving back to community um but i didn't see that as a kid with my like dad and so for me i had a really large separation from spirituality from religion um and it didn't quite resonate with me until i went to india and i started going to those yoga asana classes the meditation classes um, the kirtan that they were having and i was like oh my god i have been searching for this connection to spirituality to my to the truth of who i really am and instead i've been blinded by capitalism i've been blinded by like being on the rat race of trying to achieve which feels empty um, and that completely changed it for me. From that moment on, I continued practicing at the Ananda Sangha when I came back to Los Angeles, um, ended up moving to Australia, and it was in 2018, I got my 350 hour training. Um, and I remember walking, I will never forget this moment. It was just so visceral. I was walking to it's 7 a.m. I get off the bus. I'm like walking down like the Brisbane, like city center. It's it's going to be like the first training, like the first day of the training. It's a year long program. I'm like walking and it's kind of like drizzling very, very lightly. There's not that many people around. And all of a sudden. I just feel this like my molecules are the same as everyone around me. And it's almost like the dissolving kind of happened. I got hit with the most like visceral sense of like gratitude and like awe. And I was just like, what was that? And I was like, if that's a sign I'm on the right path, I'm here for it. Um, and I just think back to like, wow, what a visceral, just like, whoo, like I am meant to be doing this. Um, and I started doing this work like four years ago, really purposely working with folks of color because towards the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, um, I was going to a lot of Apostana retreats, 10 day silent retreats. Um, I was doing a lot of like breath work sessions. And in that, in that silence, in that practice, what was coming up was like, you need to work with folks of color. You need to create these spaces. You need to create the thing that you're seeking. And I think that's been the way that I have created in the last like four or five, six years is whatever thing I'm feeling like I'm missing, whatever feeling I'm having a, 
having strongly, whether it's like loneliness, like a sense of not feeling like I belong. I'm like, that means there's so many other people feeling that exact same way. So how can I create from that place? Um, and I think that's how the Women of Color Summit came to be. We were seeing at that time just so many summits and online conferences because it was during the pandemic that were just centering all these white folks as leaders in like traditional Chinese medicine and Reiki and yoga and ayahuasca. And I'm like, what is this? Like, this is not right. And so seeing that, me and Irene were like, okay, what can we create? And we met in the decolonization or decolonizing wellness mentorship with Eliana Chenea. So we already had like strong foundation and framework that we were learning to create something like the Woman of Color Summit. Um, so that's that's kind of like that time period. It was like, okay, through my practices, finding that stillness, that silence, the messages were coming in and I was like, okay, this feels good. This feels right. Like, how do I create from that place? Um, and so even now it's it's really anchoring back into what am I most wanting? And then is that something other people are wanting as well and creating from that place? Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm just saying what everyone who is listening and me and Hian are thinking, um, who will be listening, I guess nobody's listening to this as we're <laughs> having this conversation. Um, I love your journey and thank you for sharing so honestly and like intimately with us. Um, but I just think it's so wonderful of, as someone who has done coaching and been in white coaching spaces where it is very much like, I took a three day seminar on Ayurveda and now I'm going to teach you all. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, mm, you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And then also being invalidated for your experiences. It's just so beautiful to hear your creating spaces and to hear the inspiration for creating the spaces. Like, this is what. I was feeling that I was missing and wanted to add to the space. Like mm. I can't be the only one feeling this way. And it's true. You're not. And like, that's why the woman of color summit has been doing so well is because so many of us can relate to that experience. And yeah, it is. Wow. Thank you um, for sharing that. Sorry. I'm a little flustered. I just like, <laughs> it's making me rethink a lot of things in my own work and I love it and in the best way where it's just like yes mm -hmm. like that is the thing that drives us is like how can we like honestly and authentically and openly put in ourselves into our work and I think you just summarized how you did that really well thank you thank you yeah thank you for seeing that um because I think even with like the first woman of color summit, the art of creative living was really all about honoring this like infinite creative potential is within all of us and the same source. Um, and it's not something we need to try to like access outside of ourselves, but like the other layer on top of, we all have this infinite creative source that we can tap into this potential was that Oftentimes for folks of color, we have like the patriarchy, um, misogyny, capitalism um, on top of that. That means that a lot of times we're just surviving, like we're just trying to get enough to survive. And it's hard to kind of move from that surviving to thriving. So for us, it was really starting to like unravel those layers of what keeps us stuck. Like what keeps us in those same sort of like patterns of I can only get enough just to survive. Like I don't even have time to tap into my creative potential to even thrive. Um, and so I think for the first like summit that we had, it was really powerful and having these different speakers and folks of color, like thought leaders in the wellness healing space share their perspective on what does it mean to create from that like very embodied place and from a place like we don't feel fearful or stressed out. Because I know for myself, when I'm creating from a stressed out, fearful place, it doesn't usually do that well. It's usually just like not so great. Um, so it's like, how can we use these practices to kind of come back into that softness, come back into that stillness 
really tap into like, okay, what am I really needing? What am I wanting? And not devaluing like our own experiences, our own thoughts, like our own innate wisdom that's coming through and just honoring. It's like, it's really coming through. Like, let's get it out there. Um, and then from that place, like creating. Um, so yeah, I'm really glad that that resonated with you because I know this year with the Woman of Color Summit, we the first half of the year ended up taking a break to really think about like for this next iteration of the third summit for the next group program, what is it going to look like? What is it that folks are needing? And I know for me and Irene, it kind of started getting to a place where like, we're just doing so much. Um, let's take a little bit of a break, you know, in work on our individual projects, like with our clients, and then come back to it from a place where like we feel more centered and not so much like chasing or needing to keep up like the momentum. Cause I feel like we got on that train of like, let's keep up this momentum. And if we think about nature and there being seasons, like we can't keep up the momentum. Like let's take our foot off the fucking pedal, apologies for my language, and take a break. And so for the Woman of Color Summit, and even for my own work, it's like honoring those seasons. And also honoring, I know for myself, like I was having my own meltdown like two weeks ago <laughs> about like being a little bit slower. And I was just like, is it all gonna end? And I just had to kind of also honor you know, if that's what's coming up right now, then that's okay. If that's what needs to express itself and kind of going back to like surrendering to the reaction, the reaction, if that's what's happening, you know, it is what it is. And I'm not going to try to force it to be anything else. Um, so it's, yeah. And I, I think that's where also like all the practices really come in handy. It's like that discernment piece of like, how much of this feeling I really need to dive into, how much of some of it is just the stories that we're creating. And when do we really need to just sit down and take a break? And that's totally fine. Yeah, thank you so much for, you know, sharing all that. Like, wow, I felt like I resonated with so much of what you shared. Uh, you know, I definitely feel like that overdoing like too much or like there's a lot and, mm -hmm. and wanting to um, kind of be more um, at ease with the seasons, right? Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, you know, it, it makes me think of the quote that goes on the line of like, you know, nature never hurries, but everything mm -hmm. happens. Um, I'm mm -hmm. like paraphrasing, <laughs> but it reminds me of that um, because I think about it in my own life and um you know this work that i'm doing with you know with zara and individually as well um and i also just feel like we're living in a time where um it's really traumatic like there, mm -hmm. there's so much trauma and grief and you know wherever we can i guess give ourselves more ease and grace um and really thinking about doing things more seasonally i think mm -hmm. that could benefit us all, even though, of course, at the same time, knowing that there are structures and systems in place, right, that keep, that keep us from maybe thriving, because <laughs> I, I mean, I have to be honest and say that when I think for myself, um, and, and my own, um, you know, personal work of wanting to be thriving is a lot of what, um, like, a lot of the barriers um, is really like capitalism and mm -hmm. classism um, and ableism and like all these um, things that um, kind of weigh, weigh um, me down a little bit, but it really makes me feel hopeful to know that um, someone like you and the work that you're doing is just, you know, perhaps creating more spaces where people can even imagine themselves thriving, right? Like, mm -hmm. how can you imagine yourself thriving in 2022? like during it's like pandemic maybe another pandemic coming mm -hmm. up and like the uh fascism that's happening and like all the injustice and 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 inequities right um so yeah uh, Zara did you want to say anything I'm, I'm just like really kind of taking in everything that mm -hmm. Harpenter has just said um, yeah, but you know, as usual on this podcast, anytime I have something really interesting to say and someone asks me about it, it goes right out of my brain. <laughs> um, 
I, it's funny that you mentioned the reaction to the reaction of time mm-hmm. moving slowly. And this is off topic because my brain, um, but I, because that's exactly what I was thinking when you were talking about the seasons of things and how you're acting and like, okay, this is just where I am. And that like level of self-compassion. And I was going to say this earlier in the pod, but I was like, keep it to yourself. But now I'm like, share it with everyone. But I saw that exact quote on Instagram the other day and I went, I don't have time to think about my reaction to the reaction. And it was like, because I notably have a problem. I'm, I've been working with self-compassion, right? And that is just being compassionate with the way we react about something. And yes, yeah, it is just really beautiful. So thank you so much for bringing that in. Um, and I, this is again, also random. I want to f- phrase this in the right way. As someone who grew up um, with like, a Muslim-ish background. (laughs) Uh, I am curious how your background as a Punjabi Sikh within the yoga world, because there is right now, um, there are a lot of like great Hindu teachers. There are also some who believe it is strictly a Hindu practice. And I'm just curious how uh, your upbringing maybe as a Punjabi Sikh as impacted your work as a yoga teacher and maybe like that decolonization of your work in yoga Mm. yeah I mean there is so much to unpack there um and where are where I will start with this is one of my teachers Prashad Rangankar um who is amazing anyone who is interested in yoga on the path of yoga I would definitely recommend checking him out he always has like wonderful courses that he does um but in a course that I did with him maybe a few months ago now he had this like timeline listed out on like the history of yoga and he laid it out based off of like the religions of that time of Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, Hinduism. And the way that he explained it is like yoga came out of these four religions. It came out of these four religions and has this like timeline of how it overlaps with everything. And I think the core thing that he was talking about there is that these religions have a lot of their ideologies, the values that are very similar, Um, that belief in the karmic cycle being common across all four of them. Um, And I mean, I've been seeing it quite often now where there is that Hindu nationalism and even with Prime Minister Modi of India, like when he enacted International Yoga Day, um, I'm trying to think of what year it was, but he's the one that created International Yoga Day as a way to kind of say like, okay, yoga is Hindu and as a way of kind of like reclaiming it as a like Hindu practice, Hindu spiritual path. And the problem I see there, if we're thinking about decolonization and decolonization kind of moving away from like the dominant forces, um, what we've, what we're seeing in India and have been for the last few years is like the Hindu party and mostly prime minister Modi, I should say, doing things like going after Muslims, going after Sikhs, um, and it's using like violence and it's using these pow- like their power to do these things. Um, and so I just wanted to like put that out there where like that is what's happening in India right now. And there is a little bit of like wanting to use yoga as this like weapon itself as well. Um, and what I also want to say is a lot of yoga does have to do with Hinduism. Like we also can't say that that's not true. Like that is very true. But what I also want to honor is this path and this practice, when we start to think about it being something for everybody and it not being like a religion or something you need to indoctrinate yourself with, it is all about how do we access Purusha, Purusha being like our consciousness, our true self, like timeless, that's connected to the same consciousness that runs through all living beings. So it's the same thing that connects me to you, that connects me to you, Zara, to, to you, Hien. 
And so I think that's what it makes me think about. And and I know there's also, when we talk about discernment, there's this fine line, you know, because we also don't want to start spiritually, spiritually gaslighting when people start saying things like we're all one. And it's like, you know, let's talk about the nuances. Like we can acknowledge where the practice of yoga and this pathway comes from while also talking about the nuances the nuances of how it has originated from these four main religions. Um, and I, I did a course with a professor either from Berkeley or from a university in Canada. I can't remember. And I will be honest in saying I only caught the first, it was a four part course and I watched um, the first half of the first one. So like I have them all saved and I need to finish them. But he actually had this like whole four part course that I need to get back to that talks about yoga and Sikhism. And it talks about at the time of like the 10 gurus of Sikhism, how there was that like mingling, the idea exchange that was happening between Sikhis at that time and yoga. And so right now my answer would be so much better had I actually completed and watched the entire course, but this reminds me to go do that. Um, and I think, when I think about also this like decolonizing where I come from having this like being a Punjabi Sikh, I think what it come, takes me back to when I think about yoga is like having that compassion, connecting back to that Purusha, the consciousness, getting rid of like the ignorance of who we truly are. Um, and that kind of goes along with like moving past just like this individuality, like this is who I am. And that kind of goes into some of that Western, like hyper individual individuality, like this is who I am. This is my job. This is how I've succeeded to like shedding some of those layers and wanting to be more community centric. And when I think about like the Sikhism, like values, community is so high seva giving back is so high and those things are similar to what's in yoga so i know for myself and my upbringing in my practices have been similar to what i've seen now being on the path of yoga while also what i will say two years ago my cousin saw me wearing i, I always wear an ohm around my neck on my um on my necklace and he looked at me and he was just like what is that um he was like why aren't you wearing like a um, Khalsa, like a symbol of the Sikhis on your like necklace. Why is it Om? Like we're not Hindu. And he's a Sikh male that said that to me. And I had to kind of like unpack that, unravel it with Navi, Navi Gill, who's another um, Sikhi yoga practitioner, Ay Ayurvedic practitioner and unpacked it with her. And I think, I think what's happening there is we start to take on what other people have told us like what is ours and what isn't and i think that's the difference between like religion and spirituality or religion is this very like structures and rules and this is what it is while spirituality i feel like even moves past all those like self-imposed boxes that we create it like moves past that and connects us all deeply and i've said this before and i'll say this now before turning it over back to you sometimes i get very long-winded um is when I think about religion, I feel like you strip away all the shit that like humans put on top of it. All the ideas are the same. It's, it is truly about being a good person, giving back, that there's a higher power. How do we come back to faith? How do we surrender? And instead we use these like, I'm this religion, so I am different from you. And we create all these like false separations. And it's like, at the end of the day, I'm you, you're me, and it's all the same shit. Um, but it's like we we keep wanting to separate ourselves. And I think that's becoming even more and more prevalent into this year with Russia and Ukraine and like all these things that are happening. Where there's so much separation. And um, if I pay too much attention to the news, I can definitely feel myself moving from that faith to fear. And my practice is how do I keep coming back to faith? How do I keep coming back to trust? Um, because there are some scary things happening right now and we need to be aware of it. Um, in Buddhism, what they teach is it like really touching, feeling that suffering, but not getting swept up in it. 
Um, so the practice is how do we actually view all of that and not get swept up in it, come back to our practices. Um, so that was a very long winded kind of all over the place answer. Um, but I hope that answered some of it. Yeah. Thank you so, so much for sharing that with us. And I agree. Yeah. It's, I think it is a continuous practice of, uh, finding that balance between faith and fear and like being aware of what's going on and not spiritually bypassing while also not falling into like the panic of individualism almost of like, I, I can't fix this. What am I supposed to do? I can't do mm -hmm. anything. We're all fucked or whatever. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, and I want to be mindful of our time. So I do want to ask you the question, which we ask all of our guests is what's one more thing. What's one more thing. What's <laughs> one thing you want to see more of in wellness and what's one thing you want to see less of. And that can be specifically in your field or whatever you feel called to talk about. So one thing I would love to see more of in wellness is more funding, um, more money actually going into folks of color that want to create these like community spaces that want to create these like healing spaces um because i'm just not seeing it and i know for myself and the work that i do with the woman of color summit and even with like i like we want to offer accessible services in terms of like cost in terms of like location and we have applied for so many grants like we've done a lot of different things and time and time what we see is like especially as we're talking about event like vc funding is like are you an app are you a tech thing and i'm like can we like everybody let's get together let's like change our priorities um so i would just love to see more funding to folks of color that are wanting to create these like community healing spaces and wellness um so i think that's going to make a huge difference in us like giving the resources back to the global majority and like being able to create these spaces where we can heal what do i want to see less of oof do we have another six hours um I feel like what I want to see less of in the wellness space is this like hyper focus on yoga equals asana. Yoga is an exercise practice um, instead of it being this spiritual practice that's here for us to connect more deeply with with ourselves and then be able to connect more deeply with those around us. Because um, if I think about if each one of us was more like mindful graceful compassion also to ourselves the world would look like a very different place um so those will be my answers thank you for that and you know yeah yes to wanting to see more funding um you know it's interesting as you know we always we always ask our guests this and I don't think anyone has said that one before Zara and you know I feel similarly in that I would like to, you know, apply for grants and find funding. And um, I feel like I would probably run into a similar trouble of like, are you an apt or are you like a tech startup or something? So um, I want to say thank you for naming that and, and just maybe putting into the uh, putting kind of like that idea out to our listeners that if you are someone who could perhaps help fund something um, maybe, you know, give back, um, or in some ways it's kind of like reparations in a way. Um, mm. and so we always like to also ask, you know, how can people get in touch with you? Yeah. So if anyone's made it to the end of this podcast episode with me, thank you. And if you would like to connect further, my website is harpinderman.com. Um, I'm sure this will also all be in the show notes in case you need the spelling of anything. Um, and then on Instagram, Facebook, I think as well, um, TikTok, it's Harpinderman Yoga. Um, please follow me, send me a message if you hear this episode. I would love to hear your thoughts if you have any questions. And then for the Woman of Color Summit, it's the womanofcolorsummit.com and then Woman of Color Summit across Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Um, so yeah, follow us there, get connected. Thank you so much for talking to us today. So 
so this is now our um, post interview after we talked to Harpender. And um, that was amazing. I love her. Um, yeah, Zara, what, what are some of your thoughts on the conversation we had? Um, well, all of our listeners will be happy to know that I have started taking notes during these interviews so that all the thoughts I have aren't outside of my brain by the time we get to this part. Um, yeah, no, I said this in the bonus episode and you guys will get a little sneak peek of that. Look, talking to Harpender was like a warm chocolate chip cookie in the sense that like the conversation was like gooey and familiar, but also like something you've not had before in the sense of like, I've not had that conversation with her before and every chocolate chip cookie is different, but like wonderful. And oh, yeah, it just like left you feeling that feeling of like comfortably filled, like fulfilled with something that nourishes, I don't know, nourishes your soul. I'm not talking about cookies and nourishes because this is, <laughs> I'm so sorry, everyone. I'm trying not, I'm trying to like rush so I can mute and tell the dog to stop. Um, yeah, my dog has thoughts too and she loves it. Okay, I'm, hold up. Yeah, um, no problem at all, Zara, because I'm just in the background like laughing um, because, you know, Zara's dog and just about every um, podcast recording likes to um get Zara's attention and you know it's like I can't argue with that because she's a sweet little doggy even though I know Zara's like hey I'm trying to set boundaries with you here but yeah. um yes absolutely to what you said um the conversation was just like a warm chocolate chip cookie and I want more like it just has you want it's like it it's like nourishes your soul and you're like I could have another one or like several um and I feel that way about Harpender where I could probably have many more conversations um with her um oh absolutely and I love like she made so many points that I really wanted to touch on and I think one that is I'm just really jumping off the bat here is I think it's so fascinating how Harpender Irene her co-host co-host co-collaborator of uh, the Women of Color Summit, how they met through another, I don't know, we'll call it training. I don't know if it was a training or like a group. Um, and that's how we met. And I do think, and she talks so much about the importance of like, if you don't feel included in a space, if you're not in a space, or if there's not a space that is the space you want to be in, create that space. And I think it's such a reminder that yes, we need to be doing that. All of us, people listening to the podcast, if there's something that inspires you, start that space because it's creating uh, the containers for people like us, people for like Carpenter and Irene to meet and create other things and more containers. Like this is how we create the space. And I think it feels a bit like revolutionary joy in the sense of like finding people who share the same vibe with who you want to connect and create with and I think uh, I'm not like the person who came up with this but I because I'm sure a lot of other people are saying it. it's like on the left we need a vision for what a future could look like and you know having these spaces if, even if it's not a full vision for the future having these spaces where like people of color are meeting and having the facilitation and capacity or the space for facilitation um, and the capacity to like connect and be intimate with one another and build these things is what makes the space for that joy and for that collective future to come forward. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And I feel like, you know, there can never be too much of that, I guess, because I, I just feel like, Okay, like I'll be honest. Um, I may have said this before already in an, another podcast, but I am somebody who often feels uh, despair and grief of some sort, you know, say, you know, think about like joy. I feel the opposite <laughs> of that quite a bit, um, you know, just grief and hurt and pain and numbness as well. Um, and, you know, I, you know, I honor that about myself. I honor all the feelings I have, but I definitely feel like when I am in these spaces, when I am in these containers, 
um, when I am doing this type of work and helping um, to facilitate and further like add to the conversation um, with Zara, with people like Harpender, you know, with our other guests, I do feel that revolutionary joy. Um, and it feels very natural. Um, and that's just why I feel like there could never be too much of this kind of thing. And it is interesting, yeah, that she did say that she did meet Irene in um, a program and we met in a program. Um, we met in Susanna Barkataki's um, training in 2019. Um, yeah, it's just so interesting, like what can grow out of just like a chance meeting? Because like, I don't think either of us predicted that we would be doing this now, right? I never, like the day I met you, I didn't think this was going to happen. And that I didn't think, I didn't know that I would love you so much, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I know. Well, I, at first, I remember the first week of yoga teacher training when they were like, yeah, this is Hien. She's on the laptop. I was like, that is a wild level of commitment to like come to this training virtually. So at the time, Susanna did her trainings in person in Florida and Hien was her a pioneer of the virtual yoga teacher training and I was like oh like it sucks she's not here I won't even really get to know her and we did a little bit but and like every time you spoke or had something to share I was like wow she's so cool I wish she was here and then we did actually meet in person at one of the retreat days and I was like she talks to me about the Enneagram and I love her <laughs> Yeah, you know what? It's so funny to think because like I do remember that first in-person meeting with Zara. And so like beforehand, so I just noticed that Zara, you like um followed me on Instagram, right? And I like followed you back because I like figured out that you were in the training with me. And like I, you know, I like followed a few other people in our training at the time. But I didn't really think too much about it other than I was just like, who is this girl? Like, you know, I was like really looking like, who is this person? You know, like just being like, why is this person following me? And then I was like, oh, oh yeah, this is someone's in Susanna's training. Like they're cool. And then um, I remember talking to you and just being like, oh wow, this girl is just so like, has so much conviction and is so passionate and blunt. And then I found out you were a Sagittarius <laughs> or maybe it, it, it kind of was like, maybe I had found out somewhere and then felt your Sagittariusness, or maybe I felt it and then found out and I was like yeah it makes complete sense but I remember you were like trying to ask me about my type and it was so funny the way I answered because I was like well like I remember trying to sound like I knew what I was talking about but I did not because I basically said because you were saying that you felt I was like I remember you said that you felt I was like maybe a five or a nine yeah. and I said like well that's interesting and you're like oh like I think you're like maybe thinking like oh so I'm off or something and I was like that's interesting because I'm like the last time I took the test many years before I was a four wing five and I was like I don't really know what that means and you're like I see it and I was like oh okay <laughs> and then <laughs> and then since then um Zara has educated me plenty on the Enneagram and has just really helped me see it um like more deeply. Um, and I do see the both in me, the four, the fourness, and then my five wing. Um, so yeah. Yes. Um, absolutely. Gosh, so beautiful. And I really love the part of the sorry, I'm changing topics because I wrote notes down. So I know I have things to say today as opposed to normally like, what the fuck did I think during the interview? It's been 10 minutes. I don't remember. Um <laughs> But I think it was really interesting uh, where she was talking about faith and fear and how easy it is to fall into fear and faith. Um, and she was talking about a Buddhist practice of like feeling non-attachment towards like fearful things and like not getting swept up into it. And it specifically made me think of, and this is such a like weird thing and I'm sorry, it's a bit morbid. So like trigger warning death, um, but uh like there's a Buddhist practice where monks would sit with dead and decaying bodies uh, to practice the non-attachment to like the grossness of death and like the sadness of it, right? And like the fear and all of the things that get caught up in it. And it is really such a practice of sitting with all that is bad and not going fuck and screaming into the void eternally you know and gosh 
it's that's I don't know it makes me wonder how is that also the case for like faith you know what I mean like where it's like if fear is sitting with like death and decay and like being okay with it and letting that happen on the other end of that is my eternal optimism do I need to like develop an like a non-attachment to that where it is like you like I think they're like I guess it's like a form of spiritual bypassing can you like spiritually bypass in faith you know I don't know I don't have this thought fully fleshed out because again I just took little notes but yeah I don't know yeah do you have thoughts yeah. I find that really fascinating. Um, yeah, wow. I I gotta. I feel like I have to sit with that. Um, and I think perhaps it is like what you're saying about you know maybe I need to be not attached to faith and like you know maybe it can look like spiritual bypassing. It reminds me of a conversation I had recently with somebody. And by conversation, I just mean like we exchanged a few tweets. And so um, there's someone on Twitter I follow who is um, a Buddhist um, and, you know, they're like a young person. They're like a Buddhist and um, an abolitionist. They're like a leftist person. So they're like a political person um, like myself. And they were they had a tweet that said something on the lines of like, oh, um, I don't know how some people have made it through the last two to three years. Um, with all like the grief and the trauma in the world um, and not end up really religious because they were saying how um, because of everything that has happened, their way of like coping and dealing with it is to get really um, into Buddhism. Like even they grew up Buddhist, but they um, got even more Buddhist, I guess. Like they um, found um, a lineage that works for them or that they um, felt like they believed in and they just feel more like um like there's I guess support they feel more of the support in Buddhism and are really and are really leaning into that and I responded right I and you know what I said was you know I wish I could be more religious because I find that what's difficult for me is that I can't like the Buddhist spaces I've been in I don't necessarily feel like it's um, for me, it's either too white or too spiritual bypassing for me in my experiences. Like I, I mentioned that, but I was saying that like, you know, but I've always been spiritual. And so I'm like thinking, and I said like, you know, I hope one day, you know, maybe I can be like you and like find a lineage or just, you know, feel more um, dedicated to like a specific practice or path or whatever. And their response surprised me because, you know, there was a part of me that think like, oh, maybe they'll give me idea. Like, I don't know why, but my mind went to like, maybe this person who's also a young person, like, you know, someone in their twenties will give me ideas for like, check out this place or my teacher, or, you know, I don't know why I, I thought that way. And I think I thought that way is because in like the wellness world, like the yoga, spiritual bypassing mm -hmm. world, they would give you recommendations, right? It's like, oh, you should talk to my coach, right? Or like, oh, you should sign up for this training I did, right? But instead they said, oh, that's totally fine. Like um, they said some of the lines of like, you know, it's there's there's like merit and not being um, attached to any certain path as well. And that it was a good thing that I was already spiritual and that, you know, some of the things that I've learned along the way um, will count, right? Will we'll, we'll quote count, so to speak, in terms of like, Buddhism and um, get accumulating like merit. And so I don't know that that was what came to mind as you were sharing that. Um, uh, because I kind of feel like sometimes I wish I did have more faith. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that because I struggle a lot with that as well. So I grew up, uh, I say Muslim ish uh, <laughs> for reasons I don't feel like getting into right now but also like my grandfather was a buddhist and did buddhist prayers until he died but he converted to islam because it was popular in the area and it was a way for social it was a way for upward social mobility in my opinion from what i have gathered from that understanding i didn't meet him so obviously i can't know for sure but like so i've always struggled with like oh i don't fit into one thing i need to find one lineage or one practice and that'll be a thing but i don't i think that is very much it is it, there is something special in not finding not finding a specific path and i think that's kind of where 
the struggle with faith versus fear comes in where like, it's really easy to have faith when you have laid out directly in front of you, what faith looks like and how to have faith and where you go for faith. And I think when you are more on a, I fucking hate how goddamn co-op this phrase is, but when you're on a spiritual journey, I'm so embarrassed by that statement. I'm so sorry, everyone, but I can't think of better words at this moment. Um, but like when you're on that spiritual journey, it's it's hard to keep the faith all the time because you don't necessarily always know what you're getting from it, where you're going to get it and where it's coming from and stuff. But I do think when you find it and like create that space for yourself, there is like, it's it's your personal spirituality. It's not the spirituality you're told to. So the faith almost feels deeper in a sense. And I think people can find that within lineage. I know there are people with, who are Christians, people who are Buddhist, people who are Hindu, Muslim, who have that level of not toxic faith where it's either spiritually bypassy or like dogmatic, but like a true commitment to it. But I also see it as well in people without lineage. I don't know. Yeah. So I think we both are kind of on that hard journey of figuring out how you keep your faith when it isn't, it doesn't come in a box. You buy all the parts separate, so to speak. Oh, I like that. Zara, you're coming in hot with the metaphors today. Like, I feel like it's usually (laughs) me and my weirdo self with my weird metaphors, but I love your metaphors today. First, a chocolate chip cookie. And now it's like, you're, it's like, what did you say? Like, it's the parts instead of the whole thing. Yeah, I am really feeling that. And I feel like I just want to say to to anyone listening that um, you're you're not alone if you are like kind of wrestling with these like big questions as well with like faith and fear. And the only other thing I want to say with what um, both of you were talking about, like what you just, I guess your thoughts on what Harpenter was talking about being like seeing people diving into sort of fear um, and trying to stay on the path of faith, say versus fear um, is that I feel as if, and we had this conversation a long time ago, Zara. So you can like kind of fill in the details. But we talked one time. I don't I don't feel like we ever had it on a podcast. It was just like a personal conversation about how um, you were following somebody who was saying that in the next few years, we're going to see an increase in like cults. And I, all I could think was, well, not all, but like when Harper was speaking about that, I was feeling that because I kind of sensing that around me of just like the polarization that we see like politically but also like culturally right um and like the way our economy and the systems we have don't really support our basic needs and so there's a lot of like scapegoating of different like groups right and it's just like really fear-based and then people fall into like these like traps with these like charismatic narcissistic leaders right (laughs) you know there's always a grifter somewhere right um and so yeah that was something I was thinking about and how I really hope I guess I just really hope that we make it through we being like not just you and me or the listeners but like we being like humanity like I really hope that uh, humanity makes it through these dark times and through these like maybe tempting cults that I feel like happen because people slip into fear and some of it is very valid fear but like you can't stay in the fear and and you know go down that path like it's not that's not right um wow yes okay two things I want to say is one I do I want to like specify that I was not condoning by any means like cherry picking and culturally appropriating things from religions that you can just like use for yourself because like I understand chakras, you know. So first I just like need to clear that up and get that out of the way. We do not condone that on this podcast. Um and secondly, yes, and I see it I see it happening everywhere right now. Um the cults like I, if you, I don't know how many of you are around cis men who are just like living the average life in the world right now. Uh, They're pretty much all being indoctrinated into some sort of weird, sexist, pro-capitalist 
world by uh, podcast hosts. Yeah, yeah. It's like fucking weird shit going on right now. But like also within spiritual communities, because anytime you see fear, it's so easy to grab people and say, oh, I have the way. I have the way. Look at the coaching industry. Oh, do my five steps and you'll make $3,000 a month. Do this and you can quit. Uh, do this and you'll find love do this and you'll be skinny forever and you can eat potato chips all fucking day like it's lies it's all lies but when you are fearful and you're like stuck in diet culture and you're like oh my god if my body is not a fucking weird thing that I sculpted like Kim and Khloe Kardashian that I must be broken you know okay I guess I need to do this weird thing where I can eat chips all day but I'll never gain any weight ever again you know, like you fall into those things because it's easy because that's fear. And I, this is where I hope I don't have spiritually bypassed optimism, but I think right now we're building a new world. And I think it's really easy to build furniture when you have instructions for it. Oh, here, run another metaphor. Um, it's really easy to build furniture when you have the instructions for it. But like, so it, it becomes a lot less harder to see or like build that furniture when you just have a picture. And like right now we don't even have a picture, right? We're just trying to build furniture. So of course we're going to like put some wrong pieces together. And I mean that collectively and I mean that individually. Um, and that's why I think this is what I come back to is like my thing that I think will help a lot of us have faith is I think we all need to be picturing what the fuck we want the world to look like when this thing is done. You know, it's not if we're going to get to the other side, it's what do we want it to look like when we do. Yeah, I agree with that, of course. I mean, I feel like the idealist in me um, definitely agrees with that. And I, I don't think that you are being like spiritually bypassing with your optimism um, because we need that. Because if all of us were nihilists, and I say this as somebody who has nihilistic tendencies, and like I often, it's kind of funny, like I I, I often go um, to like therapy and a lot of, well, I would say within the last year or so, a lot of the conversations I've been having in therapy is not as much around like interpersonal me and relationships. Um, sometimes it is, but a lot of it is about like, the despair and depression and grief I feel with uh, the state of the world. And I will like, you know, laugh with my therapist um, when she's like, oh, you're like casually nihilistic. And I'm like, yeah, I am. And then I come to the next session like, hey, I'm nihilistic today, you know? Um, but I, but like, we can't all be that way. And and if you are that way like me, that's great. Um, but, you know, there is a place for this type of like hope and optimism and faith that you speak of Zara. Um, and even though I say I'm casually nihilistic, sometimes I also have a lot of that hope and optimism because I think it helps me to keep moving forward towards the visions that I have. Uh, absolutely. Well, and that's like the thing is, it's, I think we're all in a state of casual nihilism all the time. And I think that's by GOP design on some level, because like when we know as trauma practitioners, we know this, what can you not do when you're in a state of survival? You cannot think about thriving. You can't think about all the possibilities that your life could have you self-limit. As we talked about with Harpender is like you self-limit because you're like, I can't even get there. I'm just trying to survive. And I think it's easy to fall into casual nihilism. Obviously, we need a level of casual nihilism because, <laughs> ah, yeah. Um, otherwise, we might all just, I don't know, not make it to the end of the week in one way, shape, or form, you know, one way or another. Um, but like, it's coming back to, okay. I can't do it like it's because that leaves you in a place of, like I have no control and we need to figure out like how we have control in our own lives and I think if we know what we're working towards if we have an idea of what we're working towards if we can see a picture of what the furniture looks like we can figure out how to put it together but if you're just looking at a bunch of wood panels and screws you're going I don't fucking know what this is 
It could be a bed frame. It could be a dresser. I could be building a fucking shelving system. I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. So I don't know. It's okay if you're feeling that way. And it's, it's also important for you to find space to find that faith and figure out what it is that the world is going to look like for you. Because, you know, we can't have an episode where I don't stand on a soapbox and tell everyone what I think they should do. You know, that's just that this apparently what this podcast is. I'm so sorry. (laughs) No, I don't think you should be sorry. I think that, well, first of all, people know they don't have to do anything that we say or suggest or what our guests say and suggest. But secondly, like, you know, you're asking really provocative like or not provocative but like thought provoking (laughs) (laughs) you're asking really thought provoking uh questions and you're sharing really like thought provoking interesting um thoughts and you know I think people have to hear that um and also you know I'm you know I just want to ask you know is there anything else um you want to share yeah what's on your mind today let's just wrap it up with telling everyone what's on our minds yeah so you know today what is on my mind is that I am definitely in a state of trying to survive I wish I could say I'm thriving um but no I'm I'm not thriving I I am in a state of survival because I have noticed moments of feeling burnt out um, this summer. And um, yeah, that's that's kind of what's on my mind is that I have a trip coming up soon, like a vacation finally coming up soon. And so I feel as if um, I'm just trying to hang in there and see where I can find more ease before I go on my vacation. But yeah, I just, I don't know. I just want to be honest and say like, I'm just trying to survive. <laughs> um, same. I'm going to answer how my, what's on my mind, just because I thought I was muted and I screamed during your talking. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, what's on my mind? <sighs> I'm so sorry to end it on a negative, but it's fucking monkey pox. Um, yeah, this like secondary global virus of concern that we're all experiencing um and it's not I mean like obviously I have a fear of monkeypox also this is a big thing that I just found out if you have any form of eczema psoriasis skin condition you are at high risk with monkeypox um but what's really bothersome to me is just the way it's been covered so much in the media where it's like oh it's only men who have sex with men and it's like that's fucking you're inciting a gay goddamn panic you fucking dum-dums um where it's like really frustrating to me to see that we have learned zero about how to share things with people and it's not even like monkeypox is a fucking novel virus that we don't know anything about we know about it we are just deeply misinforming people so that when school starts and all these children start passing it to each other all the fucking alt-right people can be like see they're grooming our children which disgusts me so if you don't know a lot about monkeypox right now and I feel like our listeners probably do but please talk to people about it please 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 it makes me that's where I'm at I'm just talking to every I want to talk to everyone about monkeypox right now because I have a genuine fear and eczema And I am just deeply worried for the state of public education and how the fall will look when we are already short-staffed on teachers in the entire country. I am not following my own advice of not falling into the fear though right now with this. So I'm gonna take a second and breathe. And say, yeah. So if you're listening to this and you also feel panic, take a second and breathe. And just talk to people, keep having conversations, sharing information from credible sources. Um, Yeah. And we love you. (laughs) And we're sorry that the world is this way. (laughs) 
we love you. We love you so much. And I just want to say, Zara, you're a freaking real one because I'd be lying if I said I also haven't been thinking about monkeypox a lot. And so I'm so happy that you're saying something. I mean, by the time our listeners are listening to this, I'm scared, sadly, that they will know about monkeypox. Um, but that all that to say, <laughs> we love you. And um, thank you for listening and for being here. And please take care. Bye Thank for now. You. Subscribe to our sub stack. Thank you. We love you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Thoughtful Wellness Revolution podcast. For bonus content, you can go to thoughtfulwellnessrevolution.substack.com and subscribe for $5 a month. You can also follow us on Instagram at Thoughtful Wellness Revolution to share your thoughts. And don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you're listening. <laughs>